Hi, my name is Nicole Ivanov, and I'm here to talk to you today about JavaScript async await, keeping your promises without writing them. Now, there is a history behind async functions in JavaScript, and I'm just going to go over each of the previous iterations with you briefly. So first, we had error first callbacks. Now, this is the first way that asynchronous code was handled in JavaScript. And the first argument in the callback is going to be an error object. And if that is null, then you have um, no error and it was successful. But if it is not null, then you had an error. Now, this seems simple enough for small functions, but when the calls get more complicated, this can lead to what we lovingly refer to as, you guessed it, callback hell. <laughs> and here it is, the dreaded callback hell. That devil looks a little too menacing for my liking, so I don't think I'm going to stick around here. But luckily, promises came along to rescue us from all our callback horrors. <laughs> and here are those familiar promises. But however, we're often not creating promises, but we're actually calling functions that return promises and we extrapolate their values. Now, some of the problems that are caused by error-first callbacks are actually solved by promises, but we're still using callbacks in our dot thens. So we still have to organize our code in a different way because of its asynchronous nature. But async await has come to our rescue, thankfully. It is a new feature that allows you to write asynchronous code that looks and acts synchronous. Now let's take this one step at a time. So first we have our async keyword. Now the async keyword is put in front of a function to denote that it is asynchronous, and it will automatically return a promise. Now the function setup is basically the same, plus you're just adding the async keyword in front of the function keyword, as you can see in the top example. In, um, if you're using ES6 arrow functions, then you just have to put the async keyword in front of the parameters or lack thereof, as you can see in the bottom example here. So, an <laughs> async function can also contain an await expression. This pauses the execution of the function and waits for a promise's resolution. And then it resumes the async function's execution and returns the resolved value. So in this case, we are fetching a call that John made to his mom and returning it. Instead of having to dot then off of this call to our database, we can use a wait to assign it to the result of a value that we would be getting from a promise. Now, you've been told a million times that you can't set a value to an async function or return it, but now you can. This allows our asynchronous code to look and act more synchronous, which makes coding it more intuitive and simple. Now, clearly, John traveled back in time and called his mom in 1992 because that's when he promised he would call. <laughs> But what happens if John forgets to call his mom and our async function fails? How do we handle our errors without dot catch? That is where try catch comes in. So we actually go back to vanilla JavaScript with this and use the try catch error handler. This is not specific to async await, but it can be used for handling async errors. Now the try block contains async actions and statements, and it must have at least one catch clause or a finally clause or both at the end. Inside the catch block, um, is where you log or handle your error. It is important to note that we are still using promises under the hood, and the return value of an async function is implicitly wrapped in promise.resolve, so we don't need an await keyword on our return statement. The documentation on async await is pretty sparse, and it only gives examples of how it would be used in vanilla JavaScript. But let's be real, we're almost never going to need to use async calls in our vanilla JS bubble. We will, however, most certainly need it in out in the wild in our applications. So I want to highlight how, we can be, how they can be used in various places in a React Redux app. My examples will be coming from an e-commerce app specifically. So here we have an example using an express route. And in our promises example, we make a get request to our products page, which makes a call to our database using product.findAll. And to access the promise this call returns, we have to dot then off of it and res.send our resolve promise from inside of the dot then callback. But in our async await example, we can make our code look and act more synchronous by using the await keyword to hold our call to product.findAll and put it in a variable. And then if we wanted to, we could make other calls or actions in between, and we would still be able to res.send our all products variable later on. Now here we have a SQLize instance method. In this example, I'm defining a SQLize instance method to find the total cost of an order. To walk you through this example, a find all call to the order product join table is being made to find all of the lines in an order for a specific order ID and assigning it to the order lines variable. 
Now we are also declaring a total price variable and looping through all of the order lines. Inside of the loop, I assign a product variable to the returned or awaited promise from the call to our product table. I then reassign the total price variable to equal the line quantity times the product price. Then I return the total price. As you can see, I'm only showing you one way to do this, using async await. I tried to do this with promises, but it was nearly impossible and ridiculous with the amount of dot thens and callbacks you would have to do in different places. Now you can, this is how you can see the real usefulness of async await. Its way of making async code more synchronous makes it much more easy to do complex asynchronous calls. So in order to use async await for the last two examples I just showed you, all you need to do is make sure that you have the latest version of Node installed. Anything version 8 or above should work. So here we have a thunk example. And as you guys know, this is on the front end. Um, and this, is, this thunk example is fetching all of our products and dispatching them to the store. Like in the previous example, our dot thens can be replaced by assigning the values originally returned by our callbacks into variables and awaiting their response. Then we can take our products and dispatch them to the store and catch our errors. Now our thunk is much more clear and easy to read. However, to use async await in the front end, we do need to install some dependencies. So here are what we're going to need to install as front end dependencies. Async await is currently in the stage three proposal for ES7. So we have to set up a few things for it to work. First, npm install Babel stage three and Babel polyfill. Next, include Babel Stage 3 in your Babel RC presets and set your plugins to transform async to generator. The presets are various ways that you need to transpile your data. We also need to add Babel Polyfill as an entry point to create an ES6 environment with the necessary functions that async await needs to run and transform async um, functions into our own code along with the, um, so they're alongside in the bundle.js. Add the polyfills at the entry point so that those polyfill functions are added to bundle.js alongside our own code. These should be the only extra dependencies that you need in order to get your app up and running with async await. And then here I have some more resources for you. If you actually want to use async await, I would really recommend it. It's really great. Thank you.